Okay, good uh, good morning everyone and uh, nice to see you all after after our break over over Chodesh Nissan. Um, it's nice to be back uh, back in action. Um, I was asked by uh, I, at the end of the last uh, topic, if you remember, on uh, which we were looking at um, a rabbinic authority, I think we went through Torah Shval Peh and then we went through uh, the concept of Das Torah and various other related sources. Um, I was asked by a few people to talk about um, the issue of shadim or uh, demons and demonology in uh, in the Talmud and the Gemara. Um, the particular trigger for this was that around the time that I was finishing my um, the last topic, the, the topic of rabbinic authority, um, the Dafayomi got up to uh, the last chapter in Pesachim, which uh, has a remarkable incident in which a uh, explanation of a halacha or a context of halacha is quoted in the name of a shade of a demon of sorts. Um, it's in the context of a, a, a mystical halachic topic anyway, in which the sugya talks about um, the appropriateness or unappropriateness of doing things in pairs, a very remarkable idea. Um, the, the Gemara brings that there was a fear that in uh, doing things in pairs, doubles, for example, drinking two cups of something, it's in the context of Sukkot that talks about uh, the about Arbakosis, there's some danger in, uh, in uh, doing things in Zugos, in pairs, and uh, the Gemara brings a source that discusses this danger from one of the Shadim, from one of the, the demons. So uh, what exactly is our perspective on uh, Shadim, on demons? Do they exist? Don't they exist? Um, are they dangerous? How do we understand them? Uh, what are the references in the classic sources to these ideas? So um, the truth is our, our, uh, our sources, particularly the Gemara and uh, the Zoha and other such sources make a lot of reference to Shadim and uh, later rabbinic literature carries on on the topic and uh, Shadim is a discussed phenomena. Um, the first uh, reference, if you like, to the concept of Shadim, um, perhaps meant to be understood as Peshat in a Pasuk, um, really comes in the Torah itself. So uh, I want to share my, uh, my screen and uh, look at a Pasuk together, which uh, classic sources understand to be referring to, uh, to, to Shadim. Um, it's difficult when looking at these sources to know what's the most, the best chronological way of presenting them, because obviously I want to start with the Pesukim. On the other hand, as we are aware, there is no specific Pesuk which references Shadim. Nonetheless, the Mufarashim understands a certain Pesuk to be referring to uh, Shadim, to demons of sorts, um, though in the context of the Pesuk, it's not clear cut uh, what exactly is meant by this uh, reference. I'm going to share my screen and we're going to look at a Pasuk that talks about the concept of uh, um, Shadim. And this is a Pasuk that says as follows. It's a Pasuk in uh, Sefer Vayikra, we read it uh, not long ago. V'lo yizbuchu oid es zivcheihem l'seirim. One should, they should no more sacrifice their sacrifices to the seirim. Now, who are the seirim? Um, well, a soy uh, is often understood to be a goat. Um, Seirim might be linked etymologically to uh, hair. Um, maybe it's sa, something to do with hair. Um, or perhaps some form of demonic figure. Now, we know in ancient mythology there were demonic figures that looked like goats. Goats had a demonic uh, reputation. Um, to this day, if you ever look at a goat and you look in its eyes, Goats have quite strange and uh, scary looking eyes, demonic looking eyes. For whatever reason, goats were associated with demon worship. Um, satires are half goat, half human figures. And whilst um, they're sort of presented as cuddly, nice creatures in uh, more, uh, more recent literature, um, it's not clear whether the way they're presented in which the upper part of the body is a human and the lower part of the body is a goat um, was a physical explanation of how they looked or more of a... Um, a sort of a conceptual explanation in which they were viewed as half human, half goat, a goat-like human figure, which is a demon of sorts. The Pasuk says, One shouldn't offer sacrifices to these satires, these demonic goat-like figures. 
Ashahin Zoinim Achreim, that they veer off after them, they go straight after them. Chukas Oinam Tia Zoinim Achreim, that they veer This is an eternal statute forever. These Seirim, by the way, are also mentioned in um, Hazinu. Hazinu also references these, uh, these Seirim, some form of uh, um, uh, goat like demon. Perhaps that used to be uh, used to be worshipped. Now, what are these seirim that are um, that are referenced? Um, what is their nature, and what are we meant to think about them? So, first of all, we have a translation issue. What exactly? What really is the translation of seirim? And secondly, we have a conceptual issue, which is um, if these seirim indeed references shades and references demons of sorts what is the pasuk saying is the pasuk saying that indeed there is a, such a thing as demons or is the pasuk saying there are people who believe in demons but you shouldn't follow them don't go after that practice and worship them um, in much the, much the same manner when the torah talks about idol worship and it says don't serve idols or it references uh, the gods of egypt it doesn't mean to say that the Torah is saying these things really exist. It's simply saying there are those who uh, believe in them and uh, therefore don't uh, go astray after this belief in these demonic uh, figures, these satires of sorts. Um, similarly, when the Possum talks about magic and the Possum says one shouldn't engage in magical practice, um, Kishuf, the Torah is full of references to magic and the prohibition against engaging in magic. Does this mean to say that magic really exists? Or does it mean to say there are pagans who believe in Kishof, who believe in magic, and don't veer after them and engage in such awful practices? So this is a, a general machlokus um, throughout uh, the, the, the history of the Mepharshim, particularly the Ge'onim and the Rishonim, who address these issues. And to some degree or other, it, fits, it splits into the familiar divide with which we are, um, are used to, between um, those who are labeled the more mystical school of thought and those who are labeled the more rational uh, school of thought, whether they take these things as real forces, which the Torah prohibits, or imagines nonsense, pagan nonsense, which the Torah prohibits, because this is nonsensical. Now, th there's much said, particularly in recent years, about this divide between um, sort of rationalist and mystical thinking, in the Rishonim and the Ga'onim, but I think it's important to, uh, to make clear that the divide is not as ironclad as one would um, think. So it should be thought of more as a spectrum than a black and white on-off digital divide. So whilst on one end of the spectrum we have the Rambam, for example, who is dismissive of probably everything, almost everything in the sources that nowadays in the 21st century we would um, question, and therefore the Rambam doesn't believe in astrology, he doesn't believe in uh, um, Shadim, he doesn't believe in Kishuf and magic, he certainly doesn't believe in the reality of uh, Avodah Zorah, um, etc. Um, so the Rambam in a sense rejects all these concepts. He says it's not that the Torah is saying they are real, but don't do them, but rather the Torah is saying they are nonsensical. Um, nonetheless, we have to realize that going back in the past, it's not clear cut which should fall on which side of the equation. So let's take astrology as an example. Um, to the 21st century mind, it's obvious, or, or to most people, most uh, Western people who are educated in science, one would assume that astrology is a nonsense, is a myth of sorts. And therefore, um, we'd say, okay, if you're mystically inclined, you would accept astrology, it's some supernatural type thing. And if you are more uh, attempting to understand the universe, understanding in, uh, in a scientific basis, then one would reject astrology. But of course, this is a superficial look at the topic, because it may be that in current science, we don't understand astrology as a scientific phenomena, rather it's some sort of metaphysical or supernatural phenomena. If you go back uh, 800 years, 700 years, Maybe um, there was some, uh, one could have thought there was some scientific mechanism through which astrology could influence the fate of um, human beings and the events that occur to them. So the idea of the distinction between that which is mystical, which you will only accept if you sort of believe the world has mystical forces versus the more uh, scientific or philosophical mindset which will reject these ideas, is not such a clear cut divide. Indeed, for example, the Ibn Ezra, 
who is, um, was an astronomer, not an, not an astrologer, an astronomer, a scientific observer of astronomical features of, of renown, and was very philosophically inclined, um, and probably is grouped amongst the Rishonim who uh, are trying to avoid the existence of the supernatural beyond that directly associated with Hashem, um, and in general is uh, dismissive of mythology and uh, demonology and magic and the like, um, was also a convinced astrologer. So Ibn Ezra, who, who sort of belonged, if you like, to the philosophical camp um, of Rishonim, was very convinced of astrology because he believed it had a scientific basis. So not everything which is um, uh, sort of presents to the 21st century era as a divide between a scientific worldview and a mystical worldview, um, is, is it clear and obvious which line of the divide it should fall on? Similarly, we have the Rambam, for example, who's a renowned Kabbalist, Makobol, one of the leading uh, figures in our history who brought Kabbalah into the public domain. But he was also a doctor and a philosophy and a philosopher and certainly very much of a scientific mindset for the era in it, which he lived. So the division between the two is not um, clear cut at all. I also want to make clear that I have absolutely no intention in this discussion of, of even treading near the territory of taking sides in this debate. There are great figures on both sides and it's important for us as um, uh, learners of Torah to try and, and uh, engage seriously with both schools of thought. Um, the assumption that we can clearly determine um, with a scientific worldview what does and doesn't exist is, 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 is obviously 21st century hubris. Um, anyone who understands the philosophy of science and on science itself understands that we still know very little about the world. Um, I have absolutely no intention in this discussion of, of taking a, a particular stance. And when I label one rationalist and one mystical, I don't mean to imply that um, the figures who adopt the more mystical stance aren't rational in the sense of being reasonable human beings. Chas v'shalom, of course they are. I simply mean that they have a hashkafa and a perspective on Judaism in which they are um, happier and, and open to seeing a, a wide variety of supernatural events which we humans interact with and engage with constantly, as opposed to uh, what we label the sort of the philosophical Rishonim, who say, no, Hashem created a world which works through the systematic application of the rules of nature and science and philosophy, and we humans have to strive to live in this um, physical world and elevate it by finding meaning and spirituality and chesed and mitzvahs and doing good deeds, but not that we engage and interact in a world full of mystical forces. Now, certainly to the 21st century mind who engages seriously with science, this outlook and Ashkafa presents a, a path which very often we can engage with in a meaningful way to enhance our, our Judaism and our relationship with it. And for me personally, this is um, a path that I find very meaningful and important in my own attempt at Avodah Hashem. But that doesn't mean to say that in any way there's a, a taking of sides in, in, these, uh, in these debates and in these matters. So here we have a pasuk which talks about the Se'irim, these demonic um, uh, forces um, referred to in later literature as Shadim or demons. And the pasuk rejects them. It tells us don't serve, God forbid, these, uh, these uh, forces. But whether this means to say that these are real forces that actually exist, or whether these are nonsensical beliefs, and that's why the Torah is rejecting them, seems to be part of the general machlokas, which we already referenced around this whole topic of um, um, how one approaches these ideas. And I would stress again that um, it's not obvious and clear cut which way the science lies, and certainly for the Rishonim, um, who had a very different scientific experience and different access to science, this wasn't clear cut. Um, much of what we believe in modernity to the philosophical or rationally inclined to show them may have appeared as mystical. The idea that there's um, invisible living creatures um, called bacteria which um, infect and affect our lives and our health or, or viruses which aren't even living creatures in the normal understanding but almost little bits of programming that can somehow have an enormous impact on our lives and how we function or radiation which can uh, um, create energy and positive forces on the one hand and be exceptionally dangerous on the other that can allow us to see through solid material and x-rays. The idea that we live in a world in which constantly buzzing around us are constant radio waves communicating uh, information from one end of the world to another, all of this might have appeared uh, mystical and nonsensical in the past and presumably um, technology of the future to us today 
would also appear as, uh, as something non-existent. So one has to be cautious how one approaches these topics. Um, nonetheless, this is a Pasuk in Vayikra, which tells us not to sacrifice to Shadim or Se'irim. And um, what are these Shadim? How do we understand them? So the Ibn Ezra, in his um, commentary on the Torah, references these, uh, the, this Pasuk, and he just tells us a little bit of translations. I'm going to share the screen to look at the comments of the Ibn Ezra, who gives us a little bit of translation of, um, of the, uh, this term, um, Se'irim and Shadim, and, and what exactly it, uh, it means. So I don't know if I'll share the right screen there. Sorry. So the Ibn Ezra says as follows, who are these Se'irim? Heim HaShadim. So he translates these Se'irim, these um, goat-like, perhaps that's what the word Sa'ir means, these satires. He says these are Shadim. But then he tells us the etymology is different. The Nikrukain, they are called Se'irim. But Avoshe Yistaya HaGuf HaRoya Yisam. The body or the person that sees them becomes terrified. By the way, the etymology of the word Yistaya may be linked to Sa'ir, hair. It means hair raising. When we become afraid, um, our, our, we talk about the hair on the back of our neck um, standing on end. Um, if you picture a, a, a spooky um, haunted house or a, a scary film one's watching, one feels the hair on the back of one's neck uh, rising. Um, we now know the biological reason for this, why that happens, but that's another topic. So he says maybe this is what Se'ira means. It means hair-raising creatures. But Koro, if he says more likely, the Meshugayim, the, the, the crazy ones, see them as goat-like um, uh, beings. So the Ibn Ezra seems to label those who see them as Meshugayim, as, as, uh, as a craziness of sorts. Now, what does the Ibn Ezra mean that it's a craziness of sorts? Um, he seems to be saying that this is an irrational belief. Either he means it's a philosophical craziness, it's, it's completely irrational to uh, imagine that such things exist. Um, or he literally means this is a, a condition, tragically, of someone suffering from, uh, um, from mental health, someone suffering from uh, um, um, challenges to their well-being and their, their whole ability to function in the world. And they experience, uh, tragically, um, fantasies of fear um, and hallucination in which they imagine the existence of these uh, demonic forces. So here we have a reference already in the Torah itself to the belief in, in such, uh, um, such beings. And the uh, um, Ibn Ezra who says at least that these don't exist, but they are uh, the products of fantastical um, minds, uh, tragically. So it's okay to be the simplest understanding of the Ibn Ezra, in which case the Ibn Ezra is following the school of thought of um, those uh, early authorities, the Rambam and, and the like, who uh, are inclined to doubt the existence of these things, literally. Now, there's no doubt that when one gets to the Gemara, there are enormous references to the concept of Shadim. And, and when one learns the sugyas, when one learns the discussions around these issues in the Gemara, um, definitely the simplest understanding of all these sources is that the Gemara, at least the Talmud Bavli, took these very, very um, seriously. Um, it's been pointed out, and I'm not going to go into this today, that the Talmud Yerushalmi makes far fewer references to the topic. Um, and this gets us into a different subject about um, to what degree um, the belief of Jews has been affected by surrounding uh, culture. Um, in the world of Bovel, um, the, uh, the belief at the time was, was very much into demonology and uh, the like. In the world of uh, Palestine, of the time of Yerushalmi, of uh, Roman occupied Eretz Israel, um, certainly from the year uh, 300 and going forward, where um, Christianity began to dominate, there was much less talk about demons, though of course there still was some all the way through to uh, the modern age. In, in uh, Christian Europe, medieval Europe, there was certainly belief in these things as much as there was in other parts of the world. Nonetheless, um, maybe there were differences between the views of uh, the Amorayim in, in Eretz Yisrael, as opposed to the Amorayim in Bovel. Th these are subjects which are much broader discussions about um, the effect of um, external beliefs on Jewish beliefs. 
And uh, in general, one has to be cautious when drawing conclusions from the absence of evidence and things that aren't said, particularly in the Talmud Yerushalmi, where we know tragically its editing was cut short due to persecution. And it's possible not everything that was uh, meant to be included there was included. Um, so either way, we're going to fo focus on the more classic sources in the uh, Talmud Bavli. Um, and I'm just going to try and share in this share a, an array of sources, just to give us a, a taste of some of the ideas that are referenced and that come up. And then we'll try and probe a little bit more deeply about what um, one is meant to make sense, how one is meant to make sense of these sources. Now, the sources are broadly split into two categories. One category is a clearly midrashic or agadic context in which the Gemara is specifically setting out to um, discuss uh, midrashic ideas. The other type of source is when there's a casual reference to a shade and it comes up in, in a completely different discussion. So there's a halachic discussion or, or a description of events that are going on. And in that non-midrashic context, a shade, a demon, happens to be mentioned. And the reason I point out there are these two sorts of sources is because whenever we read the Gemara, we need to understand what the Gemara is saying. If the Gemara is in the context of a midrashic source, there's a very old discussion amongst uh, the mitharshim, the commentaries in the Gemara, about what the idea of medrash or goda is. And it's uh, generally accepted amongst all schools of thought, the philosophical, the Kabbalistic, that medrash and agada is intended to be um, uh, uh, poetic or um, uh, allegorical or metaphorical language to describe uh, philosophical concepts. Jews didn't speak philosophy. They spoke a narrative or literature or medrash as a way of conveying philosophical ideas. And to this day, actually, there's two ways of discussing psychology and uh, metaphysics. One is directly to talk using the scientific language of psychology or the language of philosophy. And the other way to do so is by using medrash and literature to do so. So you can gain psychological insight from great literature or a great work of art. Art is a, a medium of communicating ideas. And Chazal adopted storytelling and art as a means of sharing philosophical or psychological ideas. And this is not controversial in the least in Jewish thinking. The, the title of this series was subtitled Differences Between the Ramchal, Yutzata, and the Rambam. Um, and interestingly, both the Rambam in Moen Avochim and the Ramchal, representing these two very different schools of thought, and everyone else who has addressed these issues, from the Gaonim through to the Rishonim, the Maral, the Vilnagon, figures on both sides of these great, this great divide, all understand when we learn Medrash, we need to understand what the Medrash is really saying, the, the sort of philosophical or psychological or mystical idea that's underlying the Medrash. This isn't really a subject of debate. Um, the Rambam will interpret it philosophically, the, the Gaon or the Ramchal or the um, uh, Maral will interpret it Kabbalistically, but the idea that it's using metaphor and allegory to convey a concept is not really controversial. Um, for example, I'll just take one example of a famous Medrash that's taught to uh, every child in school, that when Vashti is summoned by Ahasuerus in uh, on Purim to enter into uh, his palace, to the party, and she's described as having a tail, growing a tail. So a very uh, normal way of understanding this metric is saying there's something animalistic about her. Who has tails? Animals have tails. Saying she's become animalistic. So these are, are, are very classic ways of understanding metrics. This isn't controversial. However, there are Gomorrah sources in which the Gemara seems to assume the existence of a shade as a familiar figure around the home and around society. People would bump into shadim, they would have conversations with them. Amarayim, great figures, would have conversations with them. They would, they would um, on occasion, use them for insight into how the world works, um, revealing to them uh, um, the secrets of the universe. And this was just considered, it almost looks like in Gemara language, as if this was a casual fact of life. So when we learn the sources, we need to ask ourselves whether these are Gadic sources, specifically um, sort of brought as, as medrash of sorts, or whether these are halachic sources. Now, um, someone's just posted over here asking me, isn't there a ma major difference that some take medrash literally? Um, I don't want to go into this topic because it's not, uh, as, as the question says, it's not uh, today's uh, subject. Um, it is true that 
in recent years and uh, probably throughout history, children were taught medrash without the detail being going on to, into as to whether this is to be taken literally or not. But um, it's equally true that um, a very predominant school of thought throughout the generations um, accepted not taking um, uh, medrash literally, but understanding it as a metaphor. The boundaries as to which measures should be taken literally and which are not is very, very complicated. So, of course, there is debate amongst the great thinkers about which medrash are literal and which ones aren't. But the concept that measures need not be taken literally is is not uh, is not so uh, not so controversial. Um, in fact, we'll see in a moment a Gemara, which is an exact example around that. Um, someone uh, Anthony posted over here. He said uh, towards the end of Sechus Pesachim, um, it goes on a few duffim that. Uh, um, that's correct, yes, if you're afraid about this, then it will have an effect on you. If you're not afraid about it, it won't. Um, I am going to get to that Gemara Mbisachim. This Gemara Mbisachim that Anthony referenced is going to be one of the important ones. Um, finally, someone posted to me directly about Shlomo HaMelech speaking to Shadim. Um, if we get time, we will look at that story also and see how the different Mbisachim take it. Um, for now, I'm not taking sides in the debate. I'm simply sharing the classic sources, and uh, we will look at how different commentaries take some of these Mbisachim. So I want to look um, together now at a Gemara in Chagiga, and the Gemara in Chagiga lists um, aspects of shade life, of, of the demonic uh, being. What, what's a shade in like? And the Gemara tells us six features of um, shade in. And uh, this is a clearly Midrashic or Agadic Gemara, it's a piece of Agada, and it's a classic example of a piece where it's difficult to know whether this piece was meant to be taken literally or allegorically. Is it saying literally there are such beings, or is it saying there's a concept which has these six features associated with it? But certainly the simplest understanding, and there's no doubt, is that this is meant to be taken literally. So let's have a look at um, uh, this source inside. Um, and it's a Gemara in Chagiga that we will now learn together. Chagiga Tes Zayin Omud Aleph. Tomer the, the rabbis taught Shishal Devarim Nemru Bashadim. Six things were said about the Shadim. So I'm going to make the font a little larger because I, I, I suspect on the screen um, it's a little unclear. I apologize that I should have made this font a little lar larger already. Um, let's see if that makes things a little clearer. Tomu Rabbonon, the rabbis taught Shishal Devarim Nemru Bashadim. Six things were said about uh, um, demons. Shalosha Kamalach Asharis. They share three features of angels, or shloshak v'neyadam, and three features like human beings. Kamalach hayasharis, they are like angels. They yeshem kamafayim, they have wings. Kamalach hayasharis, the tosim is sofa olam bad sofa, they fly from one end of the world to the other, like angels. The yodim masha osim didios kamalach hayasharis, they know the future like angels. So this is the three, these are the three things which they share in common with angels. The Gemara now interrupts this source and asks, Yodim Salkadatach, do you really think they know the future? Who knows the future? Only Hashem knows the future. They sometimes hear from behind the curtain like angels. And as we don't believe that angels and demons fundamentally know the future, only Hashem knows the future, but sometimes from behind the curtain, it's a common expression in Chazal, there's a, a, an imagery, this is clearly metaphysical, metaphorical, an uh, image of a curtain that um, uh, uh, acts as a barrier between the supernatural and the natural world. <coughs> angels and demons sometimes um, receive insight from behind the curtain. And there are three features in which they are human-like. They eat and drink like humans. They need to um, ingest food or nutrition in order to live. They reproduce like humans. And they are mortal. They die like humans. So they are um, beings that hover somewhere uneasily between the physical and the spiritual world. And they have aspects of both. Now, how are we meant to understand this Gemara? What does this Gemara mean? Is this meant to be taken literally or not? 
So there are, are um, many Mepharshim from the uh, um, era of the Shonim that absolutely take this Gemara literally, and they understand it is um, applying, uh, um, it's, it's telling us something about the nature of the um, world within which we live. Um, there are beings that have a, uh, a quasi-physical, quasi-spiritual dimension to them. And these are the, the Shadim who have aspects of um, human-like existence to them and aspects of um, uh, angelic-like existence to them. Um, I'm not going to go through uh, in detail um, this particular concept, other than for those who are interested, to reference the source, you can look at it yourself. This is the Ramban on um, Perik Yud Zion, Pasuk Zion of Vayikra. We saw uh, not long ago the Ibn Ezra on uh, the Pasuk there in the 17th chapter of Vayikra that speaks about the Seirim and discusses there what Shadim are. The Ramban, Nachmanides, also discusses what Shadim are on that same uh, Pasha, in that same section, in the 17th chapter of Sefer Vayikra. And the Ramban uh, understands these to be literal forces, that's how he seems to understand it, that Shadim are beings that um, have some human-like aspect to them and some uh, non-human-like aspect to them. So this is uh, the Ramban and how the Ramban understands it. And as I said, it's, it's a good example of, of how the sort of division between the different schools of thought in the Rishonim don't always pair out. This is Ramban Bachmonides, not the Ramban Maimonides, um, Ramban. Um, this is how he understands the concept and he takes this Gemara to be, uh, to be literal, to be referring to um, uh, a physical being. We'll see in a few moments that there are many other Gemaras that speak about the interaction that humans have with Shadim that also seem to understand um, uh, Shadim literally as beings with which we human beings can on occasion um, interact. Which leads us to the next question. If Shadim are somewhat angelic and somewhat human-like, are they by definition bad creatures? Are they demonic? Are they evil? Are they scary? Or maybe that's not how we understand Shadim at all. Maybe they're forces for good. Maybe these are good creatures. Or perhaps even, um, in a most speculative manner, maybe they choose. Just like we human beings have the gift or the responsibility of Bechira, of free will, as one uh, may choose to see it, maybe Shadim also have the ability to choose um, uh, to be positive or negative forces. So I want to now learn two more Gemaras with you um, out of many tens of sugyas, which we could have learned, which speak about um, Shadim. And uh, one of the reasons why I'm choosing this Gemara is because here we see Shadim in a, a slightly more um, nuanced uh, manner. And we see also Shadim seemingly to be referenced as part of uh, everyday um, part of everyday life, um, something that the Amaraim just interacted with in a, in a normal um, in a normal uh, scenario as part of normal uh, normal life. So we're going to learn three Gemaras together, in which uh, Shadim seems to have been part of uh, interaction and the uh, experience of the Amaraim at the time in. Um, their lives. And we will also see that Shadim were not viewed by Chazal as automatically dangerous or evil or scary. Um, so I'm going to share my screen with you and we're going to learn a few Gemaras together. Um, okay, so here is a Gemara in Erevin. Now I want to explain the background to this Gemara in Erevin. Um, I've printed, by the way, for all of these, I've used the gift of um, Safaria to print uh, translations of the sources so that you can look at them inside in, in English also. And the background to the Gemara is a discussion, a very, very technical discussion about the halacha of Tchum Shabbos. Now the halacha of Tchum Shabbos is that one is not allowed to go outside um, the city more than 2000 Amas, which is, is not a big stretch at all. It's about a kilometer, slightly under a kilometer. We're not as familiar as we should be with this halacha because we live in a very large city, London, and uh, therefore effectively, if you live in Hendon, um, getting out of the Tuchum is, is an incredibly long walk. You'll have to get to the outskirts of London and then walk another um, 2,000 Amas. 
how um, distant cousins who live in remote regions of London, like Edgware, um, have to be a little more familiar with this uh, halacha, because um, if you live right next to the Green Belt, then you do have to know the laws of Tchumim. Um, can you walk from Edgware to uh, Barrackwood and Elm Street um, on, uh, on Shabbos or not? These are, are very serious halachic uh, matters. So you can't walk outside the city more than a Tchum. Now, the Gemara discusses whether this only refers to normal ways of leaving a city, or whether it even refers to leaving above ten tefachim, effectively flying through the air um, above the ground. Now, um, this is actually a very, very significant halacha, um, which is of major halachic application when it comes to um, aeroplane travel and boat travel on Shabbos. So if one wishes to take a cruise, for example, um, I'm not going to discuss now all the halachas of taking cruises. One is planning to take a cruise, consult a competent rav before so doing, but it's perfectly possible to do so in a legitimate halachic manner because one's just sitting on the ship and the ship is traveling and uh, it's making its way through the oceans and I'm not doing anything myself. So as long as one has understood the relevant halachic uh, context of taking a cruise, it's perfectly uh, possible to take. However, there is one matter that surely is a concern, which is that the ship is carrying one far beyond 2,000 amas away from the city. You're in the middle of the ocean or perhaps your island hopping on the Greek islands. Um, you're certainly traveling more than 2,000 amas. And one of the very important and significant halachic factors to this is the idea that you are traveling above ten tefachim. You're not traveling on the ground, you're traveling suspended in the air. Similarly, um, not recommended, but if someone um, if through forces beyond their control, ends up um, in, on an aeroplane on Shabbos. Again, sitting on the plane itself is not in and of in itself an Issa. That's clearly completely out of line with uh, what one should be doing is appropriate to do on a Shabbos. But if for some reason it ends up being the case, um, again, consult a competent rav uh, before one gets into the situation. But if one does land on Shabbos, the travel in and of in itself hasn't been a problem because one has flown through the air. So I'm always discussing this concept of traveling through the air and whether um, one can uh, travel on Shabbos above ten tefachim. And it's a, it's a long and complex sukkya, but amongst the discussion points of the sukkya is the Gemara brings a fascinating incident that happened. And let's have a look at the Gemara inside. Tar Shema, come and listen, says the Gemara. So there's a Gemara in Erevin, Mem Gimel, 43. Hani Shev so there were seven halachic topics discussed on a Shabbos morning in Surah in front of Rav Chista. So um, Rav Chista had a, had a particularly uh, um, uh, impactful uh, base of Medrash learning experience one particular Shabbos in which seven new halachas were taught, seven halachic topics were discussed. Bahadei Panya Bashabsa, and amazingly, Towards the conclusion of Shabbos, these topics were discussed coming to Rava the Pompadisa in front of Rava in Pompadisa. So somehow or other, the topic of the Shir in the Shul, in the Yeshiva in Surah, was a subject of discussion in the Yeshiva in Pompadisa that afternoon in, um, in uh, Rava's Yeshiva in Pompadisa. Now, how did the information travel from Surah to Pompadista? There are many tens of miles apart. How did the communication get there on the Shabbos? Surely there's the halacha of Tchumim. Says the Gemara, it must be someone who traveled above ten tefachim who brought the information. So my Omrinahu, who could have possibly taught them? Love Eliyahu Omrinahu. Wasn't it, must it not have been that it was Eliyahu? Alma in Tchumim and Malam so it must be that there's no Tchumim in Ramana Yasara. So ADO has this ability to traverse great distances. He also is a Jew in good standing. He's from Jew, he's ADO Hanafi. He wouldn't break Shabbos. So how could he travel from Surah to Pompadisa? It must be a proof that one can travel above Ten Tafakim on Shabbos because ADO can do so. Answer the Gemara, no, maybe not. Dilma Yosef Shitta Amrinu. Maybe Yosef, the shade, said this um, teaching. So it seems the Gemara is open to the idea that Yosef, the shade, Yosef, the demon, um, heard the discussion in the yeshiva in Surah and transplanted the, transported the discussion 
to the yeshiva in Pompadisa. And if it was Yosef the Shehid who did it, well, Shehidim don't keep Torah, and therefore he could have travelled on Shabbos, and we don't have a proof that you can travel above 10 Tafachim on Shabbos. So this is an example of a halachic Gemara, which we're going to have to analyse what on earth is going on over here, in which the Gemara seems to consider Yosef the Shehid to be a figure that perhaps frequents the base of Medrash and could have shared um, uh, information from one yeshiva to another yeshiva. I just want to finish off with a, a fascinating um, gift that we have discovered in modernity, which is absolutely amazing. Because Yosef Shida, this character, Yosef the Shade, and you might be wondering why is a shade called Yosef, but it would appear that this shade is a good fellow. He's transplanting, transporting halachas from one yeshiva to another very helpfully, and uh, is a source, therefore, of Torah information. And we will see that he features, next week we will see that he features in another sugya in Shas, in which, again, he is a helpful figure. But remarkably, in an amazing find, he, we have a source for the existence, or, or the belief in the existence of Yosef, from beyond the Talmud Bavli. And these are the, um, the incredible archaeological digs that have taken place in Bovel. Um, in particular, thousands of bowls which have been unearthed around the area of Nippur in Bovel. And incredibly, most of these bowls are of Jewish um, origin, Jewish provenance, and have engraved on them um, all sorts of texts, including um, what would appear to be magical texts in Aramaic, um, written in a particular form, a continuous spiral that begins on the outer rim and works its way down these bowls. And it appears that they used to be placed upside down to entrap um, negative spiritual forces. And amazingly, one of these bowls that's been discovered um, includes a, a list of a cheyrem, uh, a ban against dangerous forces. And one of the figures mentioned is Yosef Shida, is Yosef the Shade. So an incredible um, fluke, when we think how little survives from the past, and out of all the artifacts that survived, this bowl survived, in which Yosef Shida is mentioned on the side of a bowl. So he's clearly a well-known Jewish character um, demonic character that exists in Bavel at the time. So um, we have a reference to Yosef Shittah, not just in the Gemara, but also in um, an external source, absolutely remarkable. Um, forgive me because I'm going to have to stop there for today and dash off to my next year, my Gemara Shea. Um, next week we will carry on and uh, look at other sources around Shadim and then try and work out how on earth we're meant to make sense of all this uh, material. But in the meantime, uh, uh, thank you so much as always for joining and I wish you a uh, good day.